Welcome everybody to tonight's BAPT webinar. I'm Richard Owen uh, from the BAPT, British Association for Psychological Type. We're a charity based in the UK and it's our mission to promote knowledge and best practice of uh, using psychological type. Uh, we're really honoured tonight to have a very special guest, uh, a distinguished uh, psychiatrist and Jungian analyst from San Francisco. He's uh, the author of several books and many papers. This is a particular book of interest for tonight's subjects, Energies and Patterns in Psychological Type. Um, so I highly recommend that if you want to know more about John's work. And I know a lot of you will probably have read it already. John's also joining us for the uh, BAPT conference in April in the UK this coming year, 2020. Uh, and we've got a really interesting uh, talk and keynote and workshop lined up from um, after the conference as well. So um, without further ado, I'd really like to welcome John tonight. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you. Nice. And so you're in San Francisco right now? I'm in my office in San Francisco uh, on a nice, crisp and not too cold day. And it isn't raining. And it's, so it's a rather pleasant uh, late fall day. Lovely. So that's the office, I guess, where you do a lot of your clinical work as an analyst. Exactly so, where I've been for 48 years, actually. That's fantastic. And I know, of, I mean, one of the main subject today, you know, is this uh, amazing model that you've uh, developed around uh, Jung's work, psychological type and the archetypes. Um, what, what's, what's your preferred title for the model that you have uh, created? somehow the default name that just came up so everybody would know what it is is the eight function attitude eight archetype model <laughs> that's the, that says it all in, in a nutshell <laughs> so in terms of the model i mean you know you're i, I believe you're sort of not in the majority in, in young analysts actually using typology so heavily in your work, is that correct? Well, of course I am an analyst and so I don't use anything uh, I hope too heavily in my work. Mm. Um, for instance, I keep a copy of the I Ching in my office, but that doesn't mean that I uh, uh, it, 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 it demand that people consult the I Ching, it gives me kind of a place to make amplifications from if I want to. Uh, uh, so the same with psychological type. There, believe it or not, there are people that I have worked with analytically with whom I've never mentioned the topic of psychological type and often never even think in terms of psychological type because it doesn't seem to pertain to where they are even though if I stopped and thought about it and withdrew from my intersubjective participation and tried to separate myself from them, I suppose I could make a few type inferences, but I wouldn't want to because I'm in the middle of a process where we have our own language and why should I impose an external language? Mm. Yet with other people are just dying to hear what I'm thinking and this way I can tell them. So those are people I share it with, and when I want, they want to know, I talk about it, and they find it interesting, or they don't. Uh, so it, it, in other words, I don't have a rule that I always talk about it, and I'm not sure that always talking about it necessarily gets at the type best. The type can be gotten to in a lot of other ways than through naming and defining. How, how central do you think uh, typology is to Jung's work as a whole? I think it's the centerpiece if you understand it the way I see it. I, I think if you think of it only as a study of superficial persona differences between people, um, I doubt that Jung himself was terribly interested in it being used that way. And in the preface to the Argentine edition, to psychological types, which is always included in the Routledge and Princeton University Press editions. Uh, it was written in 1935, he or so, he, he said basically that 
it's a misunderstanding that he used this system to type people. He was really trying to sort out the welter of material, empirical material, that appears in the course of a psychotherapy in terms of the different kinds of consciousness displayed by just a single individual in the course of a long psychotherapy. So rather than trying to just pin a label on people, he was trying to figure out what seemed to be the dominant mm -hmm. orientation or auxiliary orientation or tertiary orientation or inferior orientation of that particular individual in the shifting sands of all the things the person would think to say and all the figures personifying parts of the personality that would show up in dreams. So it became a kind of marvelous grid, um, not entirely unlike the kind of grid Beyond created in his own way with his algebra, but this is Jung's grid for different states of consciousness in a given individual in the course of an individuation process. So it's a fascinating study of the numbers of consciousnesses that one person can evince in the course of trying to get clear about what their own psyche is in psychological types, types of psychological consciousness. Quite an interesting way to look at it. And in that way, it's not an ego psychology anymore. It's much closer to what I would call Jung's self psychology, an analogous, an analogy with someone like Heinz Kohut. And when I say self psychology, I don't mean capital S self, the great transpersonal objective uh, totality image of psyche. I mean the personal self, the background person in the psyche that is a gradually gaining weight and differentiation in the course of becoming clearer about one's entire standpoint as a person. That's, so that's a, 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 a little s self. So I think it's his little s self psychology. Mm. So within this dynamic system, um, do you, you know, where do you see the, the function attitudes at sitting and, and the archetypes? So they're the main components of your model. So, so how do you kind of summarize those? Well, I, I learned an awful lot from many people, Jung obviously, and particularly not only the book Psychological Types, which at times it feels like the great unreadable at times and at other times feels essentially uh, valuable. So chapter 10 of the book gives uh, his general description of the types and there you get an eight function attitude model where he takes the famous four functions, thinking, sensation, feeling, and intuition. And then he discusses what they look each of them looks like in both kinds of attitude. In other words, you get thinking in the extroverted and introverted attitude you get, and those are two different types of consciousness. And you get feeling in the extroverted and the introverted attitudes. You get two different types of feeling, and then you get two different types of sensation and two different types of intuition. So you end up with eight function, meaning thinking, feeling, sensation, or intuition, attitudes, meaning introversion, extroversion. So you get eight types of consciousness. Those were his psychological types, and they're presumably in all people. What he then did was start to show us that they arrange themselves in a certain pattern in all of us, even though filling in the blanks of the pattern each of us will use a different or can use one of the eight rather than we don't all use the same dominant function. We can use one another of the eight for the auxiliary function. And he came up with a, a few rules for this that suggested something that nowadays we can call self-organization because we've, we've learned so much from complexity theory and work of Joseph Cambray, George Hoganson, particularly to just name two people in the Jungian field who've really given a lot of energy to this, and they're not the only ones. Um, but complexity theory 
accepts that we don't not only have complexes, but that they we have a lot of them. And that they and the interesting thing is that there's a field of complexes, a complexity that makes up all of us, and that under certain circumstances they organize themselves. So in a sense, uh, the typology is um, the pattern of self-organization, little as self-organization, in a person who is in the process of what Jung calls individuation, that is developing consciousness. So when consciousness develops out of complexity, it has the in most interesting way of sorting itself out in this eight function attitude way. And he intuited that. Um, I, as you probably know, I like to cross reference some of my ideas by looking at self-organization in, for example, the field of meaning that creates a good movie. So the, sometimes that's in the mind of the director of the movie and sometimes it comes together as the group of people who work together on the same movie, suddenly there is the darn thing, the same self-organization Jung talks about in psychological types. I was able to demonstrate in the film, The Wizard of Oz. And that we don't even know who the director of that film was because there were three of them. Those who can't say there's one auteur, maybe, maybe the producer Mervyn Leroy, or maybe just the ensemble and the material just created a marvelous complexity out of which this astonishing self-organization appears. But I was able to show that in the last scene of The Wizard of Oz, you have eight function attitudes on screen at the same time. And that that has been sort of the pattern of the entire film to, to, for Dorothy to discover that her extroverted feeling is not the only game in town, but that there are all these other types of consciousness. and. Part of her maturity is to come to terms with them. In the final scene, she's lying on the bed, and then suddenly three of the consciousnesses appear in the window, and then there's Annie, Annie M and Uncle Henry, and that's two more, so it makes five, and then another person shows up, and that's six, and she's on the bed, she's the seventh, and she says, doesn't anybody believe me about her trip to Oz? And then on the onto the bed jumps Toto, uh, the introverted sensation type, dog who's been with her and he's there to verify that she it was real and silently he that's the answer and suddenly all eight function attitudes are on screen now how did that happen do you really think the mgm studios were reading psychological types or mm. or with extra cinematic perception seeing uh, my model my eight function attitude model hardly it's a natural pattern and it appears in in not just individuals but in groups of individuals, even sometimes in nations. I think nations develop this field of typology if they're individuating. If things are not individuating, they sort of stay stuck in one or two consciousnesses and you don't get much further than, than say, well, that's sort of a, a national character or an ego of that nation. And some nations seem rather sluggish in that regard. America it has the myth, at least, that it's individuating. We, I, mean, I have one who happens to believe that. <laughs> so I can still see the eight function uh, model in our country. However, something tells me we're not in uh, uh, MGM in 1939 anymore either. So how do, whether, whether, whether America's ossifying into just one big uh, angry extroverted sensation baby, I don't know, <laughs> but it could be that way. So, so I guess what we're talking about here, you know, there's this like self-organizing emergent like system of the mind and that not only is this happening internally, but people are like constantly projecting it out there and trying to depict what this system organization is through art and film and so on. And what you're seeing in films is the same set of roles relative to, let's say, the, the the, the hero or the central character of the film. Um, right. so, and those roles, I guess, you know, you'd say that those are essentially the archetypes, the, 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 character, the characters that are timeless, that keep reappearing constantly. Yes, you know, the mistake that people make is to see it all in terms of hero psychology. And then a lot of people, even in film school, are taught Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand faces. And so everything becomes you know, it's sort of, you sort of make Luke Skywalker sort of the 
central character and the arc, etc. But what I'm seeing is instead complexity dreamed onto the cinematic co uh, uh, canvas through a series of characters at any time a, a particular type of consciousness that could not be called the hero is not necessarily the protagonist mm. center stage at least for a time and turns the entire action for instance you could make a very good case that toto uh, controls the entire movement of, of the story of uh, 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 the wizard of oz and i see him as a trickster character uh, and i see him as a kind of incorrigible uh, uh, trickster and, and, and definitely a little shadow figure. And he's by no means the hero of the story. That would have to be Dorothy. She's the heroine. But it's interesting that Dorothy and her dog have to kind of make their way through Oz. And he's the one that has to kind of expose the wizard at the end and all as a humbug and various ways making things happen. So, so here we've got your, your list of the eight archetypes that you use in your model. And I believe some of them are essentially classic archetypes that have been written about throughout time. And two of them are ones that you named yourself. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. I mean, I, 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 I chose names for two that I hadn't seen covered adequately in the Jungian literature, but were showing up in my dreams and the dreams of patients. Now, when we put this archetypes in the areas of personality, it will be noted that there are eight of them, but I hope no one confuses themselves with my assuming that the eight function attitudes of consciousness can simply be equated with eight archetypes. That's not what I'm saying. It's something much more subtle than that. <clears throat> and it involves something Jung himself did with his early diagrams that you can see of typology in his early as his 1925 uh, seminar that's been uh, originally uh, uh, edited by um, uh, uh, Bill McGuire and now Sonu Shamdasani has, has worked on it also. And it's, so it's a kind of introduction to Jungian psychology in the year 1925, given, lectures given in English. And he actually does diagrams that have become very popular in teaching typology of at least the first four functions. And he gives them a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. And he gives, and he sort of calls them dominant function, uh, which I, could be given the number one, auxiliary function, which could be given the number two, tertiary function, given the number three, and inferior function, all important inferior function, uh, number, number four. Now, by organizing the types of consciousness that much, Jung already suggests that consciousness organizes itself in a series of positions, and each position has its own standpoint. But this idea of position uh, is where I got interested in where archetypes come into play. And I think the easiest way to explain my thinking now, it would be to say that, take an idea from the Romans that many others have written about, not just the Romans, it was already present in the Greeks and it's present around the world, but it's particularly well-developed in, in uh, Roman psychology that in every place in the, Latin landscape, whether it was a river or a bridge or sometimes even just a, a glen, a tree, uh, there would be a local genius, a genius loci of that place. And that would be the presiding genius of that place. And that would be the archetype one would have to contend with in that place. Uh, 
for instance, we know in the myths of Ovid, uh, things happen, uh, the metamorphoses, Narcissus, for instance, drowns. Well, I'm sure there's a genius loci of the place where Narcissus drowned, uh, for instance, and uh, there was also a genius loci of the place where Echo uh, would talk back. And understanding that there's a topos or, or location in, is very important in which consciousness or a kind of consciousness emerges. So my idea is that in these four positions that Jung gave us, dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, and inferior, each of those is organized uh, and presided over by an archetype. And it's the archetype which gives the energy that pushes the consciousness that happens to be in that place into action, but colored by the archetype of that place. So that the dominant function seems to me to be the place of the hero archetype. And the inferior function, which often becomes, the, as Jung noted and Steve Myers has emphasized so strongly lately, it becomes the place of the inf transcendent function. Well, that's not surprising because the genius loci of the inferior function is the anima and the animus. And the anima carries the bridge to the unconscious, uh, as does the animus. These are bridges to the greater self. And so that uh, uh, place of inferiority in terms of control, but creativity in terms of openness to emergent self, that place of the inferior function is a place of tremendous potential for individuation precisely because the anima and the animus preside over it. Jung went so far as to say that essentially in psychological types and uh, it became a more an oral tradition in Zurich than it was a written down tradition that the anima carries the inferior function in a man, the animus in a woman. These days I sort of say, well, it's sort of three to one. I mean, maybe in a man, three times out of four, the anonymous figures carrying the inferior function, but sometimes you'll see an anonymous figure, even though it's a man, and the same thing with women. <laughs> three times out of four, it's a, an anonymous figure carrying the inferior function, but sometimes it's an, an anima figure. So I, I think there might, that's, I've said that as a kind of rule for myself. That, that leads me to an interesting question, actually, then, you know, if it's not gender that defines whether you have an anima or animus, you know, is it something to do with what, which dominant function you have potentially, or is there another reason perhaps? I think gender, I think gender gives us a trend. Uh, and I, 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 people take issue with me on this, but I, you know, frequently pointed out that um, the anima is uh, female, uh, even in a homosexual man very often. And uh, um, the, uh, uh, certainly, seen lesbian women with a with a with a with a, a strong animus figure. That doesn't mean that the homosexual man is identified with the anima, or the lesbian woman is identified with the anima. It's simply that there's something about the contrasexual associated with the anima animus, but it's not absolute. And we don't we don't need to, but it it isn't a, the anima and the animus for me are not a theory of love. They're not a theory of sexual orientation. They're beyond that. They're a, they're 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 the very energized uh, uh, connecting points to the broader self. Of course, they can become projected and sexualized. But any are any of the archetypes can become projected and sexualized for that matter. So I don't think, I think it's been mistaken that, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way of expressing, I think Gareth Hill put it very well many years ago, that it's a way of expressing an essential otherness and an essential openness to the other 
which is the magic of the inferior function. Since you can't control it, it forces you to kind of open yourself up to the other. And if you can accept the otherness of the anima and the animus function attitude, and you can accept that it doesn't operate like a hero and it doesn't take conscious control and it does have a life of its own and it does wander off but if you can accept its otherness from your wish to be in control which is the ego function hero point of view um the you w once you've found that it opens you up to every other other and in that sense it really is a way to transcend the uh hegemony of the hero, which has been bedeviling Western psychology particularly, but it's always a problem uh, to, to get too identified with the dominant function or to feel that having a dominant function is the way to go. I, it, it, mm. The more ecological way is to be willing to have all these different consciousnesses with different local geniuses doing different things. So the auxiliary function, as mm. I say, is a parent function and the third function is often a child function and then the otherness that comes often symbolized by a figure of the opposite sex but not always it's other in some other way is where the anima and animus are and um, these are the archetypal energies through which we get our consciousnesses and i think that's fascinating to me that they the whole consciousness is partly under the control of something that we have no control over, which is archetypal energy. It's so so hard to talk about that I practically don't talk about it in my book, even though I call it energies and patterns and psychological type. You have to introduce what I mean. I don't define energy very well in that book at all, as some people like Rhea Jones have pointed out. And I agree with her. It's not defined there yet. Mm. I have to write about that someday. So what I'm interested in in looking at further then is you, know, you you created this model from you know amongst other things you know observing people and talking with people about their experiences and seeing the different qualities with which the functions were expressing in people. So I'm really trying to get a picture of how you would describe those. How do these things actually show up in in person when any of these archetypes are you know, the ones kind of most at the foreground, you know, and, and when they're associated and carrying a certain function, what, what are they actually like? You know, what's, what sort of um, stories stand out to you of particular pairings of the functions with, with any of these archetypes that really illustrate them for people? Well, in my book, of course, I take, I, I, I let people know how I came to all this. So if you, anyone's interested, would read chapter three of my book, which is called uh, Understanding Consciousness Through the Theory of Psychological Types. And I take one exactly through the kind of journey I had. And you have to understand, I'm someone who started a Jungian analysis in 1966 in a state of reader's block. I was a highly educated uh, person who found he couldn't read a book and and so I wondered if his life had come to an end because he'd been accepted to psychiatric residency but couldn't get past the first paragraph and so I went to analysis and I discovered in analysis that um, uh, I did have a book to read that was not one of the assigned books that I thought I should be reading it was the book of my dreams in other words I, I was having dreams every night and if I wrote them down as a good Jungian analysis and would, there was quite a lot to read. And then when I read the dreams, I wanted to read what Jung had to say about them. And then that way my writer's block or my reader's block went away, not my writer's block. I had to work on that too. And they both come and go, but the, somehow I've gotten a lot of things uh, read and a lot of things written. And the way I did that was to particularly uh, take Jung seriously that if you pay attention to your dreams, suddenly you really have something that's sufficiently interesting and not collectively imposed that it can hold your attention. And so I kept seeing these things in dreams that I didn't understand. And particularly, I remember a dream where there was an older and a younger man. And I won't go into the tale of the dream, except that as I thought about older and younger, I began to think that, well, maybe 
older of the two men might be the auxiliary function and younger of the two men might be the tertiary function. Somehow that, that spoke to me as an image. There was also an image of a uh, Chinese woman that became the image of my anima. And when I realized she was introverted sensation, I see that meant something. And then going back to the older and younger man, one was thinking and very strongly, he was very aggressive and extroverted thinking and the image that I had of him. In fact, he was chasing the other fellow around who was a younger boy. He was actually chasing him around with a butcher knife and the younger boy was um, very strongly frightened and sensitive and introverted feeling. So that, aside from everything I said about my own father complex, it also told me that I had a tendency to use extroverted thinking in a rather heavy handed way, and that there was an introverted feeling shrinking part of me. Now at the time I thought these are images of my thinking function, which is older, and my feeling function, which is younger. I had no idea, although now I, I look at the dream, with, it was a shadow dynamic I was seeing. I was actually seeing my Cenex function, and as I associated more to the boy who was supposedly so vulnerable, the person I used as the image for that was also a rather manipulative person who played the victim. And gradually I got hold of the fact that that's a Cenex trickster uh, interaction in shadow. But it was my way through the shadow of first getting hold of the idea that perhaps my auxiliary function is like a father and my third function is like a boy. And then when I thought of the relation between father and son and the part of me that wants to take care of others and direct others hopefully to their benefit and the part of me that became a doctor and wanted to foster other people's lives. And then the other part of me that wanted to be a patient wanted to be taken care of, I began to see that that whole axis that we call auxiliary and tertiary is an axis of either taking care of others or being taken care of other, by others. So it's our whole axis of how we tend to relate to others, either as the person who takes care of them or the person who wants to be taken care of by them, which I think says an awful lot about most of our relations to others. By contrast, that dominant vertical axis that had my dominant function, that came up pretty clearly in my case to be a very strong extroverted intuition and that was born in analysis as my, my gift as opposed to my pathology. It was great to discover it as a gift and I think it is one, my case. And, uh, even that I knew to go into Jungian analysis, even that I knew to develop typology when I did, that was my intuition operating. And uh, so at the time I, I was doing that because those were not dominant uh, mainstream interests at those times. The inferior function for me, that Chinese laundress turned out to be that introverted sensation that I need to put things in order. And perhaps some of you may notice that I'm trying almost too hard sometimes to put things in their place in the psychology, and I'm sure it won't be to everyone's taste. It's, a, it's not maybe as messy as life is, but for me, getting that kind of clarity is helpful. It creates a kind of, it's not just compulsive, it's creative. It enables me to kind of create a living space that works for the psyche to have these things understood in, in, in their proper place. And so, that axis between my dominant and my inferior is the axis of myself and my self-development. That's and the axis of the other goes across that has my auxiliary and my tertiary. That's the axis of ways in which I relate to others. Learning that about myself really helped me see that I'm always taking care of people in a particular way, usually as I'm doing, trying to do right now with my introverted thinking by teaching. And I'm often always trying to get someone to take care of me through my third function, which is always hoping to be met and cared for with extroverted feeling. And I've come to realize 
that's great for me to know, but I can hardly expect everybody to like my introverted thinking as there is and being cared for that way. And I don't expect everybody to want to take care of me with extroverted feeling because they're going to have a different self-organization and other organizations. So it gradually has helped me get past my narcissistic expectation that other people are going to be enough like me to take care of me and bravo me or even criticize me the way I want to be criticized. It's not going to happen. I, I have to live with other people. So it's, you know, it's, it's a really the types of that. It's, it's, you know, it's a really self learning this model. And I think, you know, it can be frustrating, you know, for some people, I know, trying to explain this model to people because it, it, it needs a grasp of what the nature of the eight functions are and what the qualities of the archetypes are to be able to recognize them, whether it's in dreams or in people's behavior, and to see these, these consciousnesses, these, these complexes in people coming out. I know that- It's, once it's guess not for everyone. The, Hellman put it beautifully. The types are not easily recognized. He says that in his essay on the feeling function, and it's just so beautiful, which is in the great book, Lectures on Jung's Typology, which I read so many times, and that has the, von Franz on the inferior function and James Hillman on the feeling function. She taught me how important a, a position in psyche can be. And in her case, the, the inferior function was the position that she emphasized because it's the basis of the transcendent function, which is so important. But I also learned from Hillman how much you can learn by really taking a given function, one function seriously, and how it works. Um, so, uh, for me, it was very helpful to get hold of these uh, functions, but I found it didn't work unless I realized that the functions operate in very particularly circumscribed and defined roles, and that the archetypes provide the roles that the functions play. And so it's very interesting how I use introverted thinking to explain things to other people, to teach other people, to, to try to define things, as I think James Hillman was able to do so, so heroically. He had a wonderful introverted thinking function. He was not a particularly, he wasn't, he didn't have it in the auxiliary position as me, so it was more heroic with him. With me, it's more caretaking of others, but not everybody wants an introverted thinking hero and not everybody wants an introverted thinking father. I mean, it's, I'm stuck and he was stuck with the roles we play. And if that's not the role you're looking for in another person, it's not, it's not gonna, you're not gonna gravitate to it. But to see that the types work in roles seems to me to keep them from, well, it keeps them in their place. It keeps us from inflating the typology to believe that uh, any one of the types is gonna always speak to everybody, it can't. Because other people are not confined to the roles we want to put our types in. <laughs> so given how, how much of a different paradigm your model is to, you know, the, the Myers-Briggs interpretation of psychological type, um, you know, how do, how do you relate to that now that you've got a different, like a more like an eight function perspective? Um, well, Isabel Briggs Myers really was a genius too, in her own way, a quiet genius, introverted feeling woman uh, who came up with this big idea that the typology could really do something literally about world peace. And remember, she was doing this work on types that her mother had left very sketchy and un unfinished, but then she in the 1920s after Jung published his book, 
it didn't seem that a new types book was even needed. But uh, then in 1942, when it looked like Hitler might win the war, uh, right in her apartment, spread out on her bedspread, she started working with her mother's typology and starting to create what we now know as the uh, Myers-Briggs type indicator, hoping that if people understood their differences from each other, there'd be more world peace. It's a beautiful introverted feeling value idea. But in the process of reading Jung and trying to sort out the types, she made one absolutely sensational discovery. She took a sentence, uh, the uh, auxiliary function is different in every respect from the dominant function, dominant or superior function. It's different in every respect from Jung's psychological types. Because one sentence from Jung is not much help because he's going to contradict that sentence sooner or later in the next paragraph. But the, the, the sentence meant a lot to her. Jung had only gone part of the way within every respect. And, and in fact, though he was right, in his own book, it was an overstatement because all he was going to say, it's different only really in one respect, possibly in two. And the, the one respect is if, if the only one he saw was that if the dominant function is one of the rational functions, the auxiliary function is going to be one of the irrational functions. And that was a tremendous achievement on his part to see that we, we have both rational and irrational consciousness. That was huge. Until 1912, he was still of the belief and he got it, the idea of the irrational from Bergson and Bergson's book was basically available after 1909. So between 1909 and 1912, Jung had it in his mind that rational means consciousness and irrational means unconsciousness. So he had the conscious, he talks in symbols of transformation of two kinds of thinking. And there's the rational directed thinking that he, that's the, that's the uh, conscious principle of the conscious mind and the irrational uh, symbolic thinking. That's the, that's the principle of the unconscious mind. When he gets to psychological types, he's, he, he, he's had the red book experience. He's really been inside and met his consciousnesses with Salome's guidance and Philemon's interpretations, and he sees it very differently. And by the time he writes Psychological Types, he finishes it in 1919, but it's published in late 1920 with an imprimatur of 1921. So we're coming up to close to 100 years now that it was published. When he writes that book, he definitely tells us that there, that consciousness, not just the unconscious, is at least as irrational as it is rational. And then he gives us two irrational functions of consciousness that he names as intuition and sensation as functions of consciousness. And then he names two rational functions, thinking and feeling. So with his dominant auxiliary model, he gives us each one dominant function, which will be either rational or irrational, and depending on what it is, the auxiliary function will be the other, either irrational or rational. So in my case, extroverted intuition is certainly an irrational function. It is a conscious function in me. It's often guided me well, but by almost magical means, honing in on things that just catch my attention for gosh knows why but turn out to be right on and worth pursuing. And my auxiliary function, which is incredibly rational, my introverted thinking. So we have, so I have this works for me, the dominant irrational and the auxiliary uh, rational. Jung himself, in my humble opinion, is and not so humble opinion, is not the thinking type he's often portrayed to be, but dominantly introverted intuitive with a fantastically good auxiliary extroverted thinking. And it's the extroverted thinking that makes him such a wonderful teacher and makes Jungian psychology has been very successful. More people today know what thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition are than know, than know who, what id, ego, and superego are. So Jung in the long run, he was a great teacher. Uh, 
and his, his seminars live and his particularly in, in he's a wonderful explainer of things that are very hard to explain in a very wonderful extroverted thinking way that that that's isabel briggs myers in action to recognize that there's something else about that pairing and in, in our, and it's that if the first is introverted the second is extroverted and vice versa that alone changed my entire relation to to typology to get that mm. so that's a long answer but that's that's, no, that's great the connection model works it's great that you know we wouldn't be where we are without um that myers briggs contribution and and everybody's building on this all the time and it is really exciting to see typology developing still a hundred years later on from when it was created so or at least published about by Jung so I'm, I'm aware that the time is is past our designated finishing time and uh, there's so much we could discuss and and that we, you could share in a sense this is this webinar is just a, a short teaser really for those who <laughs> also want to come and hear you at the BAPT conference. This is, this is a very seductive ad. You're, you're, Milton Keynes. If you're <laughs> totally confused, come to this, come, fly to <laughs> England and go to the BAPT conference in, in the first weekend in April and I'll be there and I'll have a post-conference workshop too. Yeah, yes. we've got a whole day, a whole day. I mean, this stuff, you know, it's very deep stuff to, to take on board this, but, you know, it's great that we've got you for so long in the UK and, you know, you're going to be sharing a lot more of your ideas and um, it's yeah, well worth coming to, and like I said, BAPT.org.uk, the um, conference in April, Milton Keynes in the UK. So we and John's going to be doing a keynote and a talk uh, a workshop about the cultural attitudes, which is how we combine the, the dominant or the heroic function with the eighth function or the demon daimon uh, archetype. So it's, it's quite an interesting in, inter, intrapersonal connection to make and, and have those functions working together. So I know that's going to be quite enlightening for people. So that's really all we've got time for. Um, there was, uh, there's many more questions I'd like to ask, but hopefully we'll run another webinar soon, John, and we can ask you more questions. Um, well, thanks to everyone. For back to the fact that the types are not easily recognized. And so learn, learn them, learn to recognize them, and learn to recognize the archetypes that are carrying them in yourself. Once you get onto that, it's a long journey, but it gets clearer and clearer. And I have to tell you, game is worth the candle. It enables you to be a lot more effective in understanding yourself and your interactions with others. That's worth a lot. Thank you. That's a great takeaway. And I totally agree with you. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, John, for your wisdom tonight. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard, as always. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.